Hi everyone, this is Dami, the editor. Now, this week's episode is going to be just a little bit different than normal. If you've been with the show for a while, you might remember the pilot of another podcast, The Doomed Timelines, appearing on this feed. The Doomed Timelines was a show that me and Jax made, with the goal of taking homestuck fan fiction and adapting it to a podcast format, with voice actors' help along the way to bring each story to life. The hope was to make Homestuck fanfiction even more accessible than it already is, and to provide a low-commitment entry point for voice actors just getting started in the fandom. I believe we were successful in those goals. Although, unfortunately, the Doomed Timelines is no longer available in your regular podcasting app. So, for archival purposes, we've decided to bring each episode of the Doomed Timelines to the Live Laugh Stuck feed. I hope you have as much fun listening to them as we did making them. In the process of re-listening to them, I'll be honest, I've grown rather nostalgic for that time. And there is a possibility that once all the old episodes are uploaded, we'll decide to continue the show in some capacity. We're doing our best to make sure that all the voice actors credited for each episode have the appropriate links to each of their socials in the description. It's possible that the old episode's outro may not perfectly match their new social media. If you wish to find any of the actors in this episode, I encourage you to take a look at the description. And if you are an actor who has been miscredited, please let us know so that we can fix it. And I believe that might be it. In that case, without further ado, I give you the doomed timelines. Chapter 1 of In Our Days We Will Live Like Our Ghosts Will Live. Act 1 of Here Comes the First Step by Fine Specimen Retreat. The morning light was still crawling through the darkness when you woke up. For a moment, you were dazed. You had just been... This wasn't... You bolted upright. Your childhood bedsheets clutched tightly in your fists, your eyes catching on purple knitting and eldritch posters. Was this a dream bubble? Did they even exist anymore? Your throat tightened at the sight of your Lovecraftian decorations, and you waited for the eternal whispers of the horror terrors to rise in volume, but... It was silent. For the first time, your mind was absolutely still. You were alone. And all of a sudden, you knew this wasn't a dream bubble. Something had changed. Something was wrong. This wasn't your universe. This wasn't your universe. If the sound of the horror terrors was gone, then what else could be missing? Who else could be missing? Tearing off the sheets covering your body, you rushed up to your computer, hissing swears under your breath as you waited for the stupid thing to boot up, mashing your mouse key on the passive trim icon until it opened. You had to make sure. You had to check. She had to be here. She had to be here. Handshaking, fingers desperate, you typed out her handle and... Sorry, this user doesn't seem to exist. You misspelled her handle. She existed. Sorry, this user doesn't... The chat client was undergoing repairs. She was real. Sorry, this user... The servers weren't working correctly. She was real. Sorry, this... You forgot to capitalize. She had to exist. Sorry, the internet was being slow. Why wasn't her name registering? S this is some sort of mistake, some sort of problem that... Why wasn't the client recognizing her handle? Sorry, this user doesn't seem to exist. But she did. She existed. She existed. She was real and you loved her and she was... You couldn't move, couldn't speak or blink as you watched that fucking message appear over and over again on your screen as though it was taunting you with... The truth? No, no, no. You swallowed down a sob, fingers trembling, as you decided to try just one more time. Just one more time, because maybe this would work, and then maybe she was trying to reach you, and then... Turn Tech Godhead began pestering Tentacle Therapist at 4.13. Rose? Rose, what the, what the fuck is going on? Dave. Shit, fuck, shit. Rose, please, are you there? Carcat isn't responding. Are, are you even the same fucking Rose? Dave, what the fuck is happening? I can't contact Kanaya. It keeps saying her handle doesn't exist. Oh, thank fuck. Shit. Shit. 
Shit, what the fuck is going on? Are we back on Earth? The first one? Listen, I have no clue what the shit is happening. But I'm back in fucking Austin with you-know-fucking-who. What? How the hell is that even possible? I, I can't promise not to kill the asshole. I, I don't even fucking- uh, No. Oh shit, he's coming. Dave? Dave! Because if bro was alive, then there was a knock on your closed door. You stared at it, body tensing, tears stinging in your eyes, because there was no way. This wasn't real. This couldn't be real. The door opened and a blonde head peeked through the crack. She looked exactly the same. Hair perfectly styled, martini glass in hand, painted lips curled up in a fond smile, and very obviously not dead. How had you never seen that? How had you never understood just how much she loved you? She'd made mistakes, would make mistakes, but she loved you. Rosie, darling, what are you doing up at this time? You burst into tears and let your mother scoop you up into a hug, soft words spilling from her lips as she attempted to calm you down, but your gaze was still fixed on the computer, on the letters blinking in your brain, on the feeling of wrongness. Everything was wrong. Sometime later, you stopped trying to reach her after the 50th, 100th, thousandth automated response. Instead, you deleted Pester Chum for good. The glass was cool against your cheek as you lazily watched the blurry glow of morning lights rush past your brother's truck, the clashing concrete and neon of the city slowly disappearing into the distance. The ever-constant hum that had buzzed in your ears for years began to quiet down, and for the first time in a long while, you felt at peace. It was easy to turn your back on the city you had studied in, the city that should have, by all rights, been your home, your habitat, your place of belonging. But you had lost that place long ago, and any attempts to try and make it your home only increased your hatred for it, of what it reminded you of. Fire and ash and blood and rain and all the mistakes you made, the destruction that you caused, the people you left behind. Your name is Rose Lalonde, and the world you stand on should not exist. This city, this planet, this universe had been destroyed. By your own hands, no less. You had been sent on a quest of life and death, for life and death. The destruction of one universe was to make way for another, and eventually you had all succeeded. So many had been lost, and yet so much had been gained. Friends, family, Kanaya. The new universe was cultivated, was grown and loved by children who had become gods, and had been the second most beautiful thing you had ever seen. She would always be first, always. Your love, your darling, your wife. Even after all this time, you still loved her as fiercely as the day you had exchanged your vows. You had watched the world you created grow and thrive and prosper for centuries, living out an incredible lifespan. Eventually, you knew, you both knew that it was time. The two of you were tired and old, and your wife had never reached her godhood. So you relinquished yours and grew old together, surrounded by those you loved and the children you had raised together and with such satisfaction and joy in what your life had become. You had passed away next to her, hand in hand, heart to heart, love glittering in your tired eyes as you gave each other one last kiss, one last sweet kiss, before letting the old age claim you in an eternal sleep. You were happy. You thought you had finally won the game. What a fool you were. You didn't wake up in the dream bubbles. You didn't wake up next to your wife. Instead, you woke up on the 13th of April, 2008, 13 years old and in a house that had been curled up in your memories for centuries, slumbering, dormant, ignored. You woke up to a familiar room, the place where everything had started except there were no copies of the game anywhere. You woke up alone. You were alone. Because when had the game ever been fair? Grimacing slightly, you shifted your body away from the window, and Dave stopped whatever bullshit he was spouting to look at you. You all right, sis? Were my insights too real for you? Couldn't handle the knowledge your sweet-ass brother's opening up a ninja lemon factory? Dave, quite respectfully, I have no fucking clue what you're on about. He shrugged, grin widening at your words. Your loss, Rose. Your loss. You could have made millions, no, billions with a sweet-ass investment, but I'm taking you off the will. You're gonna have to sit at my will reading all alone and find out that I've only left you a sock behind like some dastardly millionaire who knew his wife was a gold digger and decided to leave her nothing and his dog everything. Shit's gonna get real in there. You're gonna fight and scream, He promised me everything! While my Ninja Lemon security guards come up and say, Ma'am, you need to calm down. And then- The analogy went on for longer than it should have, but you couldn't stop the small smile appearing on your lips, couldn't stop the wave of love in your heart at the ridiculous shit he always spoke about. 
Dave was always the same. For a moment, you could pretend you weren't in a car, but at home, your real home, sat on the porch, knitting yet another scarf, watching her tend to her small garden. In the distance, the grubs and troll children that she would take home would be running around, their laughter echoing through the air. Dave would be chatting to you through your phone, rambling on and on about anything and everything. It had been so peaceful. Do I need to bring up Freud again? Not only that, but I think Kanaya would be quite concerned if she found out I was your wife, brother dearest. Spilled out of your mouth without you thinking clearly about it. The stream of words stopped abruptly and you froze. For a moment, it was silent between the two of you. Yeah, she... she would, wouldn't she? He mumbled out quietly, eyes focusing on the road. You looked away. Uh, who knows? She might get a kick out of it, though. If, uh... When we find him, we'll uh, have to tell him that. His voice sounded forced, and you bit your lip. None of you were sure if any of the trolls had come as well. Thankfully enough, it seemed as though John and Jade had retained most memories of what had happened, while the Guardians... Well, Dave's bro certainly wasn't the original bro. He was kinder, unaggressive, supportive. Overall, he was more like the Dirk you had known. Similarly, your mother was... Your mother drank less, was more open in physical interfection. She was just there more. And yet it hurt. Both because this wasn't your... this wasn't your mom, and because you had loved Roxy dearly. As a sister, as a daughter, as a mother, and now she was gone as well. You couldn't help but avoid her, and you felt so fucking guilty for it. You weren't sure how much they remembered, if they remembered at all, or if their personalities had blended in with the beta versions of themselves. But ultimately, it had changed them for the better. Jade had her grandpa, John had both his dad and Nana, Dave didn't have a piece of garbage for a brother, and you had your mom. And somehow, they would all meet up every once in a while, as though they knew each other, as though they were friends. The family relationships in this new, old world were ridiculously complicated, however. Your mother and Dave's bro had apparently had some sort of relationship with each other at one point, which resulted in the two of you, and while they had parted amicably, they decided on split custody with visitation rights of the other child. Despite this, however, Bro hadn't been ready to be called a father, so he posed himself as Dave's brother instead, which continued to overcomplicate the matter as well as antagonize your mother. Family Christmases had been a joy. Furthermore, John's Nana and Jade's grandpa were siblings in this universe, making John and Jade cousins once removed rather than siblings themselves. Apparently John's mother had passed away in childbirth, while Jade's parents died in a car crash when she was a baby. It then became even more complicated when you found out that your mother used to babysit Jade's father and his sister, who had cut off all contact before Jade was born. Nothing made sense, because it meant that you and your friends were no longer clones of your guardians, but rather actual human children with traceable heritages and extended families. It meant that, somewhere along the line, the game stopped existing. It didn't make sense. So you'd researched and studied and written down everything you could remember, your friends could remember, obsessively poring over every note in detail and timeline, searching desperately for some kind of sign, some reason, or explanation. You studied philosophy, cosmology, psychology, hell, even game design at one point, just to try and find some answer. And you found nothing. The only physical evidence that the game ever happened was the collective memories of you and your friends. There were only hints of your powers left. Dave was able to tell the exact time of any place in the world. John always knew when and where the wind would go. Jade could find the correct dimensions of any object, and you... You had a slightly better than average intuition. Overall, all your powers were pretty useless. So after years of fruitless studying, the desperate worry of your friends and family, the final realization that the game was truly finished after screwing you all over, you finally gave up. You dropped out of your courses and began rewriting your books, made enough money to get out of the blasted city and move off into a quieter, more peaceful place to live out the rest of your days. Maybe one day you would write a book about the game, about what had happened, even if it would only be seen as a fictional story. But then again, you were done with the game. Yeah. Maybe. You answered Dave without looking at him. Your words sounded weak even to your own ears. And neither of you spoke for the rest of the journey. The town you had chosen to live in was small, yet surprisingly beautiful, practically a stereotype of those sweet little towns that the main character in a romance novel always seemed to run away to. But best of all, it was far away from the large cities. Far away from the others. Wood and brick houses were scattered across simple roads, with some small chain stores and a fast food restaurant, flower shop, and some other cute buildings dotting the main street. It was surrounded by trees and rivers and fields turning golden in the autumn evening, but despite the quietness, it didn't feel empty. Not like your own childhood home had felt like. 
No, instead it was peaceful, quiet, but alive, and it made your heart ache with a fierce longing. You had chosen this town, this place, for a reason. Maybe this way you could be just a little bit closer to her. It didn't matter what John and Jade said about letting go, what your own therapist said about moving on and healing. None of them knew what it felt like to be torn away from their spouse, from the love of their life, never knowing if they were alive, dead, or just non-existent. Only Dave understood your refusal to let go, to cling to whatever small hope that remained. This was all they had left. Your new apartment was small but comfortable, although it was certainly bigger than the one you had had in the city, and a lot more affordable. While it had wrinkled to rewrite your entire series, the success of your novels had given you a stable income. And you hoped that maybe, just maybe, she would read them and recognize your writing, your name, just anything about it, just so she could know that you were here. Once you arrived, you made sure to send off a quick text to your mother, letting her know that you were fine and had arrived safely before the two of you began hauling things up. Most of your furniture would arrive tomorrow, so you'd really only brought small and necessary items. Your mattress, pillows and sheets, your clothing, your laptop, some simple decorations, plastic table and chairs, and other tech. Hey, where do you want this? Dave asked with a smirk on his lips, holding up the spoof movie poster for complacency of the learned that he had made as a housewarming gift. Despite his successful foray into the world of webcomics, he continued to insist on using his infuriating Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff art style, although he published under a different name. You scowled at the Sweet Bro-shaped Zazerpan, mightily holding up a phallic-shaped wand. It was the stupidest thing you had ever seen. He loved it. Thank you, Brother Dearest, for such a thoughtful gift. You can hang it right above that spot. You pointed to the area above your garbage can, ignoring his dramatic proclamations that you were wasting his talent. It eventually devolved into some sort of game, with him hanging it up somewhere ridiculous and you taking it down, snarking at each other along the way. In the end, it was hung proudly beside your mattress, to the delight of your brother. The two of you sat down in the crappy plastic lawn chairs you had brought along as substitutes, just letting yourselves enjoy the contented silence between you. Are you staying the night? It's already quite late. I mean, it's only like eight or something, but uh, sure. Although, uh, we're gonna have to get something to eat, because I am starving, Rose. Like, actually about to die starving. Oh shit, was this your plan all along? Bring Dave along to help you move so you could starve him and feast on his bones. I thought you quit that witchy crap, but wait, you just moved into a small, quiet town? This would be the perfect place for you to- are you volunteering to get some food? Absolutely not. It's your town, and you need to learn how to navigate it. You chuckled at his refusal and stood up, smoothing out your tights and skirt. Anything you want in particular? I am not cooking tonight. Hey, give me a burger or something. I'll be back soon. Don't mess anything up too much. Dave raised a hand at your words before turning to his phone. The air outside was slightly chilly, and you were glad to be wearing those autumn winter skirts you had bought a while back. They were surprisingly warm and comfortable. The streets were already lit through the glow of orange lamps, and you saw a few people make their way through mainly empty streets. Occasionally, a car would pass by. It was peaceful. You ducked into the fast food restaurant, glad it sold burgers and yet didn't seem to be of too dubious quality. There were too many people inside, with only two people standing in line, while the rest sat at different tables scattered across the restaurant. Watching discreetly as you went to stand in line, you noticed two girls giggling in the corner with their heads close together, and an older man reading a newspaper in one hand with fries in the other. The two people in front of you were ordering together, the woman practically hanging off the man, her blue hat slightly askew, but it seemed friendly, not romantic. It was hard not to smile at the exasperation that was practically tangible in the air. There was a tug in your chest. For goodness sake, if you are going to insist that we eat at such a low-class establishment, then the least you could do is behave." He muttered under his breath, and the woman let out a loud, ringing laugh, though she did slide down. Her mannerisms were familiar to you, but easy enough to dismiss. "'You like it, really,' she said and darted closer to the counter, just as their order came through. They moved out of the way, and you stepped forward, but as the woman turned around to find a table, she froze. Your eyes slid over to meet hers, which were an unusually bright olive color. Her hair was dark brown and messy, though it was mostly covered up by a strangely familiar hat, and despite her mouth hanging open, you noticed a small cleft in the middle of her upper lip. Rose? Rose Lalonde? Her voice was quiet, disbelieving, and your smile became awkward. Perhaps she was a fan of one of your books? Yes, that would be me. 
Can I help you? But the woman said nothing and continued to stare. The tugging grew stronger, urging you to say something, to ask more, and you'd become familiar enough with it to acknowledge that whatever powers you had left within you were acting up. But you didn't want to talk to them, didn't want to follow whatever stupid notion your intuition was adamant you followed. Ma'am, can I take your order? The cashier asked into the silence, and you jolted out of the staring contest. Yes, yes, of course. I apologize. From the corner of your eye, you watched her friend tug her green coat, confusion knitting his brow as he murmured something to her. She shook her head, still transfixed on your face, and he sighed, before gently dragging her away. Your order came soon enough, and you left as quickly as you could, pushing down the desire to go back to ask her who she was. Even as you left, you felt her eyes watching you. Once you had reached your new home, however, it was easy enough to push the encounter out of your mind, especially since you were just as hungry as Dave. You propped open your laptop and watched shitty Netflix shows while eating your food, the two of you occasionally commenting on the ridiculousness of one actor or the impossibility of a plot point. You felt happy, content in a way you hadn't been for a while. The mattress was big enough for you both to fit, and truthfully, you wanted to enjoy your brother's company for a while. He was happy to continue living in the city, and it was a full day's journey from there to here. Plus, he'd become busier lately in some sort of rivalry with a critic who had called his work absolute stinking garbage. As a response, David continued to churn out the shittiest content possible, absolutely delighting in the furious responses he received. Are you still trolling that critic? You asked suddenly, and he snorted. Yep, it's still as hilarious as it was in the beginning. You should hear this dude rant, Rose. It's incredible. You paused for a moment before biting your lip and just deciding to ask. Why do you continue? Is it because he seems similar to- I know what you're going to ask, and no, it's not because he's like Carcat. You could feel the humor evaporate from the air. Very rarely did you ever start a conversation about everything that had happened. There were too many painful memories, too many happy ones as well. Are you sure? You whispered, and even in the darkness of the night, you could see him stiffen. Does it fucking matter? So what if he does? So what if there's a part of me that is absolutely fucking lutely convinced that it's him? Even though it's not. Because it's not, is it? Let's be real. He's gone. They're all fucking gone. And we're left to deal with all the shit that remained. His voice was harsh, grating, shattered, and you wished you hadn't asked. But maybe he needed this. Maybe you needed this. Needed to talk about what who you had left behind, because as much as you loved Jade and John, they didn't understand, not really. They had everyone they had lost back with them, and a vicious part of you hissed that they were happy to forget what had happened, to forget everyone and everything. You knew it wasn't true, but the hurt part, the desperate and grieving part of you thought it was. Do you want to talk about it? He was quiet before mumbling out. No. Yes. I don't know. For another moment, neither of you spoke. Through your curtains, only a sliver of moonlight spilled inside, barely illuminating the room. John doesn't really understand, Dave said suddenly. I mean, while he was close with some of them, he never actually fucking loved one of them, I guess. Because I swear, that asshole is aromantic, no matter what bullshit he says about being straight. The dude's never been interested in dating a single person, even with t He stumbled over the name, pausing for a second. When he continued, his voice was shaky. Even with Terezi practically flinging herself at him for that hate-love thing, John got back everyone he lost in the game. Why would he want to go back? He swallowed and nodded. And Jade, uh, Jade, like, tries her hardest to listen, but she was closer to the sprites than the alpha kids. There weren't that many trolls that she actually fucking liked. At least, not many that were still alive and shit. And she wasn't, like, dating or with any of them, or if she was, then she didn't fucking say anything about it. Anytime we talk about the fucking game, it's like she only misses the freedom. The ability of being able to fly and do what she needed and wanted to do and nothing else. But now with her off as an adventurer and taking over her grandpa's business and stuff, it's like she's forgotten everything. She makes friends so fucking easily, with barely any effort, so... Sometimes it feels like she's drifting away from us. Both her and John. So I'm left with, like, a goddamn no one to talk to about the game. About what happened, because you- He ran a hand through his hair, voice growing frustrated and helpless. 
you barely ever talk about it as well. And you're the only fucking one who... Shit, you're the only one who would actually understand, but you don't say anything about it. Instead, you put on a smile and act as though everything is fine, or you go absolutely crazy in your stupid fucking research to find some sort of dumbass solution that never existed in the first place. So when I try to talk to you about it, you just brush that shit off, just close off completely. So yeah, you know what? Maybe I am projecting just a teensy fucking bit on this dude because it hurts so fucking much to see how similar he is to Carcat. And maybe I do want to just, like, ask him out for a coffee date or something, just to see if he'll say yes or not. And who knows, maybe we'll meet and he'll be a completely different person. And shit, but maybe not. I don't even fucking know anymore. Outside, you could hear a single car drive by, humming through the silent atmosphere surrounding you. You took a deep breath. Sometimes I wish the world was destroyed again, just so I could have it all back. It was a dark secret of yours, something that sounded innocuous enough until someone understood that you would have it all gone. You were a selfish person at the heart of it. You would give up John's dad, Jade's grandpa, Dave's bro, your mom, if it meant you could go back. You would destroy the lives of everyone and everything just to have her in your arms again. Dave, as much as he liked to put on his untouchable facade, even though most of it had been wiped away as they grew up, was a kind person. He would gladly suffer in silence if it meant his friends were happy. But during that dark night, you saw him nod slightly, heard the hiss of air that sounded like an agreement. It scares me how much I would give up, Dave. I should have spoken to you sooner, to try and bring you some sort of comfort and support, but in my mind, if I did that, then it would mean... It would mean that I had given up, or decided to accept everything, that this is all that's left that will- You tripped over your words, the grief and desperation that you had forced yourself to push down to ignore welling up within your throat. That we'll forget it as well. That I'll forget her. Dave reached out with a warm hand and squeezed your own gently. God, you were so grateful to have him as a brother. I'm scared I'll forget too. Your throat felt clogged up with unused screams and wails of denial and grief, yet in a rush of air you whispered, I miss her so much. I miss him as well. He mouthed back, and you inclined your head. Your eyes were wet. In the morning, neither of you commented on the quiet sniffling in the air, of the damp spots on the pillow, of the horrible and desperate wishes that were spoken of in the night. Instead, you focused on the warm hand in your own and the comfort it gave you. When Dave left the next morning, he pulled you into a tight hug, one that lets you linger for several seconds before he drew back. You look after yourself, sis. I do believe you should be the one keeping an eye out, especially for those critics out there. But yes, I shall make sure nothing untoward occurs to me. You smiled softly at him, and he gave you a salute before swinging himself onto his seat. There was a quiet tugging in your chest, and unbidden you blurted out, Dave? Yeah? He turned to face you from his car seat, eyebrow rising as you hesitated. The tugging grew stronger and words spilled from your mouth without thinking. Try and arrange a coffee date with that guy. Who knows? Maybe it'll be quite fortuitous for you. Even with his sunglasses on, you could feel him staring intently at your face. It was difficult to read his expression to try and grasp at an understanding of what he was talking about, but after a lengthy pause, he nodded slowly. I'll think about it. With that, he started the car, gave one final wave, and backed out of the guest parking area of your apartment, leaving you to wave him goodbye until you couldn't see his car anymore. And then, you were alone. The documentarian of our story today is Fine Specimen Retrieved, who you can find at Kit Kate Munch on Twitter, and as fine specimen retrieved on Archive of Our Own. Remember to go drop some kudos on their fic if you enjoyed today's show. The narrator of our story today was Luna Fay Kaida, who you can find by messaging them on Discord at a lunar dragon hashtag 6969. The voice of Dave Strider, as well as editor and composer for the show, is Domin, who you can find on Twitter at DominoThief, on Tumblr at dominothief.tumblr.com, and on SoundCloud, also as Domino Thief. The voice of Rose Lalonde was Jax, who you can find on Twitter at Dirkification, on Tumblr at sociallyanxiousdragon.tumblr.com, and on Archive of Our Own as Amber. Jax also serves as the show's producer. 
The voice of Mom Lalonde and Nepeta Leon was Caro, who you can find at Cluckbeast on Twitter. The voice of Equius Zahak was Gizmo, who you can find on Tumblr at nazi-killing-gizmo.tumblr.com, and on Archive of Our Own as Scrapyard Gizmo. Art for the show was drawn by at DJ Doodles Art on Twitter. You can also find links to all of our talented creators in the show's description. Currently, there is no way to support the show financially, but if you'd like to support anyone, we'd like you to please direct your love towards our lovely writers and actors, without whom the show could not be possible. If you'd like to be a part of the show, you can visit our Twitter at TDTCast to find out more. There, you can find a link to our Discord server, where you can come and show off your fix, get updated when auditions are needed for new parts, or just hang out and drop us a line. Our cast is always rotating, and we'd love to feature as many new voices as possible. Remember to keep creating, friends. Thank you to Dami for editing the show and for our theme song, which you can find at Domino Thief on SoundCloud and in the show's notes. Also, thank you to our fakest fan tier member, Danny the Spoon Lord, for your support. If you'd like to get a shout out or just support the podcast, head on over to ko-fi.com slash jacksyaks, link also found in the show notes, and sign up for as little as $1 a month. For all other links, head over to jacksyax.com where you can always find the latest information. Thanks for listening. 